I'm especially grateful to be able to speak here at the first TEDx Leuven. Um, I have lived my entire life within 20 kilometers of the city hall of Leuven. And um, yeah, this building in my youth was a black building. I was born in 1961, a little bit more than 50 years ago. And at that time, yeah, the cars were still driving by the building. And those cars from the 60s may look very romantic old timers today, but they had no airbags. They had no safety belts. They had no aircoats. And they spit out a lot of nasty products that blackened the city hall, together with the charcoal stoves that were in most of the houses around the city hall. Today, it's looking much nicer. So, when we move to the 70s, when I was studying at the secondary school, I made my thesis on a typewriter that you have seen before. And this typewriter was uh, fed with paper and carbon paper. And whenever I made some mistakes, a few uh, you could leave in, but if it were too many, you needed to take a new page, lose time, and print an extra page. So it was a slow process to create this thesis. But in the 80s, I went to university and we started to have printers. And when I made my thesis in 1985 at the university, I had a Commodore 64 computer with a screen with 40 characters on which I had the text processing program to create my thesis. And then uh, I had to print the entire thesis maybe 20 times before I got it right before all the words were in the right order. So in the 90s, we all got printers around us, and I think nobody in this room uh, isn't aware of, of what a printer is. But how many of you have already used a 3D printer? I don't see anybody. Ah, here one. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's definitely not 1% of the people present in this room. Nevertheless, I dare to pretend that each of you is influenced on a daily basis by 3D printing. 3D printing is a process that is very similar to 2D printing. Um, yeah, you heard already about it from previous speakers. It's just creating products layer by layer, printed with a laser beam in powder instead of on paper. And this technology was introduced to the world in 1988, so shortly after I printed my thesis on a matrix printer. And since then, in the 90s, the automotive industry, as a first one, but many other industries followed, started to use those 3D printers to develop their products much better. And those printed products called prototypes, so the sector was called rapid prototyping at, the at that time, they allowed car manufacturers to create better cars. And I think all of you have been driving in cars that were manufactured after the year 2000. Well, that means that for sure I can say that in your car, the components were prototyped with 3D printing. How do I know? Because all of the car manufacturers around the world are customers of Materialize, and we're already customers of Materialize using our software to drive their printers before the year 2000. And each of those cars now has an air conditioning that is well packaged, packaged in the car and that is built at an acceptable price. But it's not only the prototypes that can be printed. 
you can also print actual products. And these products are also appearing today as mass customized products on large scale. So as of the year 2000, Materialize got involved in a project with the company Phonak to alter the way that hearing aids were manufactured. In my youth, in the 60s, you could easily recognize the people wearing a hearing aid because it was quite bulky, but also because all the time they took it off because it was painful to wear a hearing aid. And uh, yeah, of course, the electronics evolution contributed a lot before the US 2000 to make hearing aids better and to make the noise the, or the, the sound generated by hearing aids much more uh, yeah, acceptable to the people. But still, the hearing aid itself was produced by dipping some silicone in a polyurethane and then creating a sh shell. The silicone was taken by pressing silicone in the ear canal, and then the shell itself was always thicker than the silicone. So it meant that the hearing aid was always pressing in the ear. The system that was developed is co a combination of automatic design software based on a laser scan of that silicone impression that creates a point cloud, and that point cloud is then transferred into a design matching every patient's own ear canal. And the advantage of having a CAT model, a computer model of that hearing aid means that we can start doing a lot of optimization on this design that was not possible in the dipping process. What we can do is try to put a ceiling ring and make the hearing aid exactly a little bit smaller than the ear, except for us, the ceiling zone that we try to position in an area where you, it is least painful, where it's not too close to cartilage or real bone, so that you really have feel the pain, but really located in a soft tissue area. What we also do is for each individual patient, optimize the little chamber that exists between the loudspeaker of the hearing aid and the eardrum. Uh, so that this chamber is acoustically analyzed and that the settings of the hearing aid are uh, optimized for that particular chamber. The chamber is more complicated than you think at the first sight because there is a little chan channel going from that chamber to the outside world to equalize pressure. So, and that channel is also automatically designed, of course. Now, these hearing aids are then packaged for hundreds of patients on so-called print volumes. We print in volumes, not on 2D papers. And then manufactured for a few hundreds of patients at the same time in a printer of which the build volume is approximately 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters. And it's a printer that you could have from size-wise size -wise in your home as well. So this process has uh, completely altered the way that hearing aids are functioning today and that it have made hearing aids much more comfortable. And they are now individual for each patient and optimized. But it did not only change the way the hearing aid is perceived by the customer, it also changed a lot in the industry for manufacturing hearing aids. Because at first, in the first phase, when the technology was adopted, the, the real commercialization started in 2003, for the highest level of hearing aids produced by Phonak, which took about 20%, of their uh, total production. It was a very central production in their headquarters in, uh, in, in Zurich, um, where all the prints were sent to be scanned and so on, and then produced. Yeah? But in a later phase, 
already in 2006, those small printers were placed all over the world. And the scanners to scan the silicone impressions were placed at all the audiologists. And today, those hearing aids are locally produced, no longer in one central big production entity where everything needs to be transported all over the world. Now, this evolution allowed to take care of thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. And today, the entire hearing aid industry has been converted from the manual process to this printing process in approximately 10 years' time. So, is this technology only available to industries such as the hearing aid industry, the dental industry, the jewelry industry, that are all using printers today to manufacture components? No, it isn't. It's also available to all of you to create products uh, that you can order via a web service, just like you can order photos via a web service, or there are already printers available today of less than $1,000 that you can st install at your home. And while this has many advantages uh, to create products that are much better suited for your need, we also hope that the use of the technology will avoid what happened to the printing process, that instead of printing one page, ex uh, typing one page extra, we started to print 20 copies just to come to the right product. And that we avoid yeah, mass consumption in a wrong way, and that we can really bring the values of this technology. And that's what I want to show how important those applications can be with a few of our medical examples. In fact, this is not new, what I'm going to present. It dates from a time that I was still black like the city hall. And it dates from the early 90s, it means, when we at Materialize created the first medical models, even with what we call color stereolithography, being able to introduce colors to delineate vessels or nerves or teeth, like in this example, so that you could see in three dimensions. And these models were very useful for very complex surgeries, like separation of Siamese twins, for instance. Yeah. Our technology has been used, I think, in approximately all separations of Siamese twins that involve bony or complex artery work uh, since the 90s. But we knew that we needed to create more added value, that this was only applicable to the most complex surgeries. That's why we developed a guide technology, we call it, where we make small plastic components that fit on the bone of a patient or sometimes on a soft tissue. And those guides are based on the CT scan of the patient. In the CT scan, we can actually see much more than the surgeon can see during his surgical surgical procedure when he's operating through a small incision. So we can take, for instance, spatial relations much better into account. We can use, like in this case, a left arm that is still perfect to repair a serious bow in the right arm and to really reconstruct, according to the anatomy of the patient, in a perfect way, in this case, the wrist of this 16-year-old boy which was seriously reduced in degrees of freedom and who had, after the surgery, a full functioning wrist again and he was again able to play the guitar. Now, again, this is technology and I'm not talking about future. I'm talking about reality today because here in Leuven, we support, on average, in those months, four to 5,000 surgeries each month where this kind of guide is being used. And actually, in the 90s, I can't leave to say it, uh, a lot of people were thinking about robot surgery and navigation systems, complex systems to help surgeons, uh, to the extent that when we introduced this technology in the 90s, 
the orthopedic companies and the surgeons didn't believe in it. It's only when we reintroduced it in 2005 that at once they saw the light of the simple devices and today this has a bigger penetration degree than robot surgery in the applications for which we developed it. But today we can already go one step beyond and that's also a reality today. We cannot just print those surgical tools for patients, for instance, with cancer, where guides can be used to place the implants, the standard implants, or to do the resections. We can print in titanium powder, and we can use titanium structures to connect a denture, for instance. And this denture, uh, uh, and this support structure are, of course, unbearable to show to the world, so we can print nice supporting structures on top of it to be able to restore this, uh, the symmetry of the face and to able to fix a new eye. And so, in this way, we can recreate, with the help of a good anaplastologist, a new, a new face. Yeah? And in order to convince you that this is reality today, I brought and I invited the patient to be here. So, here he is. Uh, this is the result we can achieve uh, while 3D printing and putting the silicones on top of it. Thank you very much.